Welcome back to FYI, the For Your Institution podcast presented by Mongoose. I'm your host, Gil Rogers. Recently, I had the privilege of sitting down with best-selling author Jeff Salingo, who is working on his new book. He had a lot of feedback from recent books that he's written and is taking a slightly new approach. We talk about a lot of things from the state of the college admissions process to challenges facing enrollment teams. So I invite you to listen in to our conversation. So how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. It's nice to, uh, we've never actually met in person. Obviously, I've interacted with your content and your books and happy to have you on today. So yeah, so to kick us off and get us started, Jeff, I'd love for you to give our listeners a, a little bit of an introduction of your story, your inspirations, what got you involved in higher education and on this path of all this great work that you've been doing over the years. Well, I think like most people, you know, you don't set out in life at the age of 17 or 18 saying this is what I'm going to do and you do it for the rest of your life. It's one of the reasons why I talk a lot about thinking about your major and thinking more about skills rather than majors. So I headed off to Ithaca College in the fall of 1991, thinking I was going to be the next Peter Jennings or the next Tom Brokaw. I wanted to be a a television journalist, probably since I was in, in seventh grade. I may have a, a, a voice for radio, but I certainly don't have a face for TV. And I kind of realized that pretty quickly because on the third day of college, I met somebody who would become my future roommate at the television station at Ithaca College. And his name was David Muir, and he's now the anchor of ABC World News. So I, I knew immediately that there were some people made for that business, and I wasn't one of them. So I pursued my passion, which was really writing. And at that time, what was really called print journalism when newspapers still were around in a big way, at least. And that's what I pursued for quite some time. After college, I went to Phoenix, Arizona, where I worked at the Arizona Republic for a summer on a fellowship, ended up in North Carolina as an environmental reporter. And then in 1997, mainly because I wanted to move to D.C. because I had interned in D.C. in college on the U.S. News and World Report rankings, and we could talk about those sometime, I wanted to get back to D.C. and there was an opening at the Chronicle of Higher Education. And I was familiar with the Chronicle because I was editor of my college newspaper, so I knew what it was. But my primary desire, to be honest with you, was not to work at the Chronicle, but to move to D.C. And I got to the Chronicle, and it was this kind of fascinating place. It was owned by its founder, still at the time, and it covered this fascinating world of higher education. It spent a lot of money on its editorial product, so I got to travel all over the country to college campuses. I covered state governments, and their impact on higher education, I got to learn so much about higher education. And so every year when I wanted to potentially do something different, I got another beat, I got more responsibility, and ended up spending 16 years there in a variety of roles, including editor for four years. And then in 2013, I had already stepped down as editor, and I was editor at large, and I was investigating this idea of what was going to happen to the future of higher education. So if we go back to, you know, to 2013, you might remember this is after the Great Recession, college enrollment was starting to fall. Sounds like a familiar story. The MOOCs the year before were called kind of the story of the year in higher education, massively open online courses. Everybody thought online education was going to take over higher ed. Again, sounds familiar post-pandemic now. And so they, the Chronicle basically asked me to go out and investigate everything about the future of higher ed. I had a newsletter at that time or a blog at that time called Next, which is now the name of my newsletter, Next. And that resulted in this book called College Unbound. And in College Unbound was really meant for students and parents to think about the future of, of higher education. But it was interesting, as soon as the book came out in May of 2013, I had all these college presidents and board chairs and trustees and faculty members call me and say, what does this mean for our future of our institution? And so that kind of led me down this whole other path that has consumed me for the last seven years, which includes writing books, an academic appointment at Arizona State University, where I teach in a program in innovative higher education leadership, which really comes from that first book as well as newsletters, podcasts, and other things all around this idea of future of higher education. But I think it really shows you that no path in life is straight. It includes many detours. It includes many explorations off to the side. And it's something I tell students. But I guess if there's one theme that I think about over most of my career now, 25 plus years in higher education, 
is that I've developed a deep expertise in something. So I'm a journalist still by training, but a journalist who has developed a deep expertise. And I think that in a day and age where AI particularly could take over for a lot of our jobs, developing expertise in a particular area is helpful. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. And I feel like there's a lot to unpack with everything that's coming in the future of higher education. We'll talk in a little bit about what your predictions are for where these things are going. AI, of course, being one of them. Thoughtfully nurture applicants, personalize retention efforts, and exceed fundraising goals with our Cadence Engagement Platform's text messaging solutions. Designed exclusively for higher ed by higher ed professionals, Cadence helps you engage your audiences with the perfect balance of AI and personal connection. We leverage an intuitively designed interface and easy to use texting templates so you can have targeted conversations or scale up to expand your reach. Our powerful smart messaging can respond automatically, exactly how you would. And to measure progress, track your campaigns with unparalleled reports and analytics. Effectively meet your community where they are as we proudly feature an industry-leading 95% read rate within three minutes. It's never been easier to make every message count. On another note, I would love to hear your story of what you're currently working on that might be coming down the pipe and what people can expect to hear from you. I know you're regularly speaking, you're regularly on podcasts, you've got your newsletter. Is there other work that's coming that people should be on the lookout for? So there's probably two big pieces of work. One is what I would call for the inside higher education audience, meaning people who work at colleges and universities, and really thinking of the new learning economy that is shaping up post-pandemic. So it's clear to me that probably much like 2013, post MOOCs, post Great Recession, there's a real rethinking now about what we need out of higher education for the economy ahead. And we're about to head into a demographic cliff, as we all know, among 18-year-olds. So I'm really thinking about the 18 to 22-year-old full-time residential college experience is not going away. But we don't need thousands of institutions to provide that experience, to be honest with you. Or if we do, it's not going to be for all these institutions, not going to be more than 50% of their business, might even be 25% of their business. So what is the rest of the business of higher education going to be? And I think it's going to be a much more flexible future uh, where you have students taking courses, perhaps from multiple institutions, maybe from the same institution, some hybrid, some online, some in person. There's going to be work components to this. So I liken it a lot to what's happening right now in Hollywood where we used to have this uh, thing called television and there was shelf space. There was only so much time in the calendar or in the week and there would be so many shows and that was it. And the same thing in college and university. There was a thing called the course catalog and there were schedules and there was only so many courses you could take in a semester and you had to do it in person and you had to do it on the schedule the university put out. And I think much like streaming has upended how we view television and how we view movies and when and where, just think about how people consume all those things in every different place at every different time of day, on planes, on mobile devices, in person, together. I think the same thing is going to happen to higher ed over the next 10 years. And again, that doesn't mean the residential experience is going away, but I do think it's going to upend the business model of colleges and universities. So that's one thing I'm Second thing I'm working on is more consumer facing. I can't give too many details yet, but soon. But it's mostly going to focus on one thing that I think my most recent book didn't. And so the most recent book being Who Gets In and Why, A Year in Psychology Admissions, where I spent a year inside the process at three fairly selective universities. And if there's any feedback that I take to heart uh, from readers of that book or when I go out to speak about it, it's that. Hey, Jeff, you gave us a good overview of the admissions industry, and you really took us inside these three offices, but these are pretty selective places, very selective places in some cases, right? Can you talk to us about what is a little, and I hate to use the rankings as a proxy here, but what's a little further down the rankings? What are some good schools that are not top 10 or not top 25? What are some good schools that are not impossible to get into? What are some good schools that maybe will give us a decent amount of financial aid on top of that? And where our kids will be happy and they'll learn something, they'll find mentors and they'll probably get a good job. What does that look like? What does that world of higher education look like? We understand what the world of elite 
highly selective, highly ranked institutions look like, right? Because that's all the media talks about. But what does the rest of that world look like? And whether we're considering it or not, we kind of have to be ready for it, right? A quote that a friend told me that's somewhat famous from Mike Tyson is, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Well, everybody has a plan about where they're going to college until they get punched in the mouth. And that punch is usually a, a rejection. And so what do you do then? And so that's the project that I'm working on now. And again, I'll be talking a little bit about it in the months to come. But hint, hint, it's a book. <laughs> and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail about what the book is about and its title and everything else. But it's going to be a book that essentially explains the admissions process, as I say, for the rest of us. Because the book, Who Gets In and Why, was really focused on a very select group of institutions. I refer to it as the annual admissions hype machine, where there's the articles about rankings, and then there's the articles questioning the values of rankings, and then there's the articles about student loan debt, and then there's the articles about outcomes, and is it worth it? And then there's the articles about, yes, it is worth it, because here's the data on people who went to college and completed versus not. And then it circles back to the rankings, right? It's that annual cyclical admissions hype machine that is part of it. And it's good to hear that you're going to be focusing on, I'll call it college admissions for the rest of us, right? I worked at a you know regional private school in Connecticut for six years and another one a couple years before that. And I used to joke that I worked for the University of New Haven, not the university in New Haven, right? There's a, a significant difference between those two types of institutions, both great schools, but for different outcomes and different priorities for the learners that are attending those institutions. So I appreciate that lens that you're giving this process and look forward to hearing more, right? So I want to go back to something that you had mentioned earlier, and it's around the pieces with technology and AI and the impact those things are going to have. I know that obviously this podcast is primarily for higher education admissions and enrollment management and marketing folks. And you probably speak to a lot of them and hear from a lot of them. would love your thoughts and perspectives on what the proliferation of this type of technology is going to have in the short term and the long term for those types of professionals. I know a lot of the conversation has been centered around marketing and messaging and writing of emails. And I feel like that's the basic use of this type of technology. But that's just the scratching of the surface of the potential that it could have. But I would love you for you to dive in a little bit deeper on how in a world when there's automation, are institutions still going to be able to drive that type of human connection and have empathy for these types of students in those communications? Well, I think that actually if institutions use it properly, that they could actually drive more human interaction because they could free up humans for the work that is human centric and that is really student facing. And that is to me, the power of, of AI. I, I don't think AI replaces humans. It's like machines throughout life. Some machines, yes, have replaced humans, but mostly they have augmented human work. And could we do the same thing here? Could we augment the work of admissions professionals? I don't think anyone knows where AI is going. And I think if anyone claims, they're guessing at it, just like any of us. I think that we're going to see the immediate effects of this in the coming years. Obviously, on the student side and the counselor side, I think students are going to probably use it for, and they're already using it and helping their essays, edit their essays, short answers, things like that. I think college counselors at the high school level and teachers are using it to, again, provide more efficiency to writing student recommendations. So I think we're going to see it in that simple way. On the higher ed side, we, we probably will see it in, in writing emails and doing that type of automation and, and obviously in chatbots, which we've already seen in higher ed. I actually think at the big institutions where they get a lot of applications, I think AI can help filter those applications down a bit to make it more reasonable and more useful in terms of the ones that they will evaluate in person, right? So I think, again, that's one way it could augment. I'm wondering, though, in the long term, whether AI could actually help us rethink the entire admissions process, which is incredibly inefficient, right? Every year, we have thousands of institutions going out and reaching out to students. And every year, we have students trying to find institutions that are a good fit. It seems to me that everybody's come up with ideas in the past, right? A lottery, right? We've had 800 stories about an admissions lottery. We've had stories about a matching program like we do with medical school residencies, right? We have other ways of running an admissions process, but everybody brings up issues largely at scale, right? So 
the scale of admissions is always the problem. Well, every year we have 2 million plus high school graduates. We have thousands of colleges and universities, and we have you know, 10 plus million applications being filed, right? So the answer is always, well, we can't institute a different system because of the scale of it. And this is a problem, I think, where AI can help, right? Could there be a better matching system so that students aren't applying to X number more colleges because they know, for example, upfront how much they might actually pay, right? Whether they actually have a chance of getting in. Does it match with what they really want out of college? Again, there's all of these things that we know would actually improve outcomes on the other end. And I'm wondering, I don't think this will happen in the next five years, but is that something where AI could be helpful? I hear that. The challenge is what benefit do institutions have by receiving less applications, right? That's part of the admissions hype machine, right? Is you see the press releases every year around largest application pool or largest incoming class, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously there's now new challenges with the Supreme Court ruling with as far as access and equity in the admissions process. We could go down a ton of rabbit holes, but with that kind of context in mind, there's going to be some elements where higher education might be forced into some of these things and the the use of the technology. But there's others where I I feel like the challenge that institutions might have is, I don't want to be the vice president of enrollment that says to the board, hey, we received less applications this year. Even though downstream, you've got the right answers. There's the vanity metrics that are a part of this that can't be understated when we're thinking about this. Do you agree? Or am I completely off base? Uh, Yeah, right. There are those vanity metrics. I'm wondering if we could change those metrics in a way as well, right? Because I think that, yes, we look at total number of apps, we look at total yield, things like that. But what's the number that I think, if you're at a private institution or a public institution, what's the number most presidents and boards are worried about? Net tuition revenue, I would think, right? So what if we could tell them, we could develop a system that would ensure that you have good net tuition revenue and that you're going to have students who are engaged. You're going to have students who are going to, for the most part, we can't guarantee 100% retention, nor would we want to, but we're going to have students who are going to re-retain and graduate and hopefully go on and get good jobs. What we're probably going to have to care a lot less about are the rankings, right? And that's, to me, we're not in this business to be higher ranked. We're in this business. I'm on the board of a private college, Ithaca College, my alma mater. And if I think about what my role on that board is, it's the fiduciary responsibility. I want that institution to be there in 100 years. Do I want it to be higher ranked? Sure, it's always nice because the rankings matter. But what I really care about is that the institution has the financial resources to educate students, keep them engaged, has a great faculty, all that stuff. That, to me, is the metric we should care a lot more about, not the metric that U.S. News or Money or Wall Street Journal, you name the rankings, cares about. And I I understand that is a culture change. That is a culture change if you're in enrollment. I get it, right? Because I also co-chair the Enrollment and Marketing Committee on the board, right? And I'm sitting in these meetings and I hear what are the metrics that the members of the board are looking for. And they're looking for the metrics that they're told to look for by these external sources. And that's the thing we have to change. Yeah. And I think that is the crux of all of this is, again, connecting and supporting the student experience across this process. I mean, ideally, in a perfect world, it's you get the same amount of applications that you need for enrollments and all of those students are admittable and all of those students enroll, right? That would be the pie in the sky. That's never going to happen with that level of precision. But then to your point downstream, if you bring in the right students on the front end, those students presumably are better academically prepared and a better cultural fit for the institution to thrive and succeed. So then you're not, and I've said this for years, you're not recruiting your new students, you're recruiting successful, capable alumni, right? And so I think that's the thing that institutions need to really focus in on and avoid some of those distractions. And like you said, it's a culture change that unfortunately there are people and board members and alumni donors and whomever that if there's a dip in the rankings, well, what are some of the things you can do to gain the rankings? Boost your application numbers to get your admit rate down, right? That's one number that is manageable from that process. Grow your student community, help them stay, and encourage giving with Cadence, Higher Ed's premier engagement platform from Mongoose. 
Designed exclusively for higher ed by higher ed professionals, Cadence helps you engage your audiences with the perfect balance of AI and personal connection. Talk to students, parents, and alumni on their time and how they want. Empower your staff with integrated text and chat inboxes that gather all conversations in one place. Reach out to learn more about how our best-in-class service, support, and integrations have helped colleges and universities like yours have smarter conversations. From text to chat, make every message count. On that note, I'd love your kind of your thoughts. This is an, an, an audible type question here, but we just talked about that student experience from that first point of contact to the institution through the admissions process, retention process, career services, alumni engagement. You're on a you know enrollment board and you're part of this process. So you see these kind of, I want to say disconnected or disjointed processes at a lot of institutions, right? The student gets used to a certain level of treatment from the school while they're being recruited. And then once they are on campus, they have to log into these new systems. They have to figure things out. And then once they are graduating, they have to engage via different systems or different processes. Do you think there's value for institutions in looking at that? There's specialized tools to do specialized things at each phase of the process, but there's also probably a cleaner way to engage with students and a one, not one system to rule them all, but systems that talk to each other and processes that are interconnected and integrated. What do you see as kind of opportunities or benefits for institutions to be better there? Well, I think that it obviously has to be a more seamless system. And the thing that I just still don't quite understand is that we have an admissions office that then they just work with these students over the course of a year or a couple of years. Once they're admitted and enrolled, they move over to the registrar. And, and then there's not an office, for the most part, that really thinks about their experience going forward from there, right? You would have your, you have your academic advisor, clearly, right? You have student affairs, you have all these other offices, but there is no one that is in charge, uh, much unlike the VP for enrollment or the admissions dean is responsible for taking care of that applicant from the moment of first inquiry through the admissions process through enrollment. But once they hit as a student, which I would argue, by the way, is more important than an applicant, we then don't have a single person like the dean of admissions or the VP for enrollment that is truly responsible for that student's experience. It is then, it's all these different fiefdoms across campus and they have to move from one to the next. Now, anybody listening to this podcast who works at a university says, well, we've been doing that for generations and students have been able to navigate it. Sure, they have been. Has it always been easy? Not at all right? And we've lost a lot of students <laughs> through the process. So I'm not quite sure why we should say we should just continue to do it because that's the way we've always been doing it. And of course, you have to figure out who's going to be really in charge. And I don't think anyone wants to create another administrative position. And I'm not necessarily arguing for that here. But I think the bigger issue to get over is that everybody has a different vision for what that student experience should be over the course of two or four years. And so because everybody has a different vision, and that's why we kind of operated in this very distributed way right now, right? We have academic affairs and student affairs. And even with academic affairs, you might have a, a different schools within a university that operate things in different ways. And again, from the administrative side, that might all make sense. From the student side, it makes zero sense. Because again, students might be moving through different majors, different views of how they're thinking about things. They don't think in terms of schools and divisions and things like that. If I could be president for a day and make that change, that's what I would do. I would take essentially the VP for enrollment idea where there is one office, one person responsible essentially for guiding the inquiry to enrollment and then taking that position and porting it over now to the student experience side and having one person, one office, obviously it's not going to be one person, one office doing all the work, but responsible for that student experience then from enrollment and matriculation through graduation. Yeah, I think institutions that use the one-stop method are on the right track. They're on the right track, exactly. But there's still work to be done. And I also have to point out the irony in the fact that the title is Vice President of Enrollment Management, yet the role oftentimes, unfortunately, is a 
head of admissions and recruitment. And there's less of a role when it comes, if they don't oversee student affairs, they don't oversee academic affairs, then it's not truly to the potential that type of a role can and should have. I go back to uh, a few years ago, I was working at Encora when it was NRCCUA, Edge Ventures Research. Uh, I'll give Kim Reed a shout out on the podcast. She developed the maturity model for enrollment management. And it had this timeline of where does your institution fall? And at the immature phase of this model, your enrollment office is the recruitment office. Your job is to go get inquiry cards and applications and to process those applications. As you progress through the model, there's institutions trying to shape their class, bringing in certain populations or developing certain new majors and programs. And on the very far end of the maturity model is the VP of enrollment literally has a seat in the cabinet of the president and is part of those institutional priorities and is a voice in those areas. And I think we just, we need more institutions to go in that direction and really as an industry say enough is enough from finding new students. It's just like in any business, it's cheaper to keep your current customers than it is to go out and buy new ones or find new ones, right? And so if we can do more from a retention and a persistence perspective, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to make up for that demographic cliff that we all keep talking about and hearing about, but then keep doing a lot of the same things as the way we've been doing them. That's my two cents there. <laughs> That's my, you, you got me on my soapbox there for a minute there, Jeff. So I appreciate you taking the time to join and share your insights and your perspectives. Let's give our, our audience the best ways to connect with you and get in touch with you and be a part of your community and to, to be in touch with you regularly. I write a newsletter, as I mentioned, called Next, which comes out every other week. I do a podcast with Michael Horn called Future You, which also is is about every other week, sometimes every week, depending on the season when we're doing it. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm on threads now, like everybody, probably less and less on, on Twitter and Instagram is where you could connect with me. I, I really try to connect and, and answer people's questions and comments and things like that as, as best as I as best as I could. And I guess the the one thought that I do want to leave people with is that I, I understand that this is a pretty stressful time for most people in higher ed. And the future looks particularly bleak in some cases for some institutions, particularly when you're thinking about enrollment. I'm actually pretty bullish on the future. And if you're only looking at, at it through one dimension, I understand why you might feel pretty negative right now. But if you think about it through the prism of multiple things, so not just about revenue, but also thinking about expenses at a university side, we always think, well, how can we bring in more revenue and not really looking at the expense side as much as I believe we should? Looking at additional segments of students, I think that everyone is pitting their future or pinning their future, I should say, on another single segment of students, meaning oh, if we could just find the next 18 to 22-year-old full-time, full-pay student, wouldn't that be great, right? Well, they don't exist out there. Those unicorns don't exist out there. But if we could build a future at our institutions where we have the 18 to 22-year-olds, we have part-time students, we have more transfer students, we have some adult students, we offer not only degrees, but credentials, so that we think of a series of different product lines, and I know that probably word kills people in higher ed, but that we're not just offering a single product of the bachelor's degree. And you know, we're also not offering 20 degrees or 20 products, I should say, where maybe we can't do it all very well. But you know, a couple of different things to a couple of different audiences so that we're all not so reliant on bringing in every year X number of inquiries, X number of applications, Y number of applicants, and, the, and to yield X number of students. Like, you know, that's, we're so focused on that number because it drives, it drives the university, it drives the college. It, it's what makes it go because most of these colleges are 90% tuition dependent. Well, they're 90% tuition dependent on that 18-year-old of whom there are fewer and fewer of them. They are much more price sensitive. They're asking a lot more questions about value and they are willing to go over to another school if it offers them 500 more bucks, right? So I think that we have to really think about, okay, we're going to have that segment of students, but we really have to think about these other segments and how to serve them as well. And we will leave it there because I think that is the lesson that we all need to learn, internalize, and start executing on, right? I appreciate it. And for our podcast listeners, we'll make sure that all of the links to Jeff's newsletter, his podcast, et cetera, are in the episode notes. We appreciate you taking the time to listen. And Jeff, thank you once again. 
And we will see you all next time on FYI. Thank you.